Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 514. The coronavirus test may be overly sensitive. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moppin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health, and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moppin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. At BioBalance Health, we have been watching uh, our patients' experience with COVID with very interest interest and curiosity as to how many of our patients got it, how many are getting it, how do we know they have it? How seriously do they have it? And and do they have symptoms if they have a positive test and how does this work? Mm -hmm. Because we are all about prevention and many of the things that we do, testosterone, uh, zinc, uh, quercetin, a lot of supplements that we use, improve our immune system so that we can withstand exposure to a virus and not get it. Well, w- when this was a new pandemic mm-hmm. and we were all frightened and we didn't mm-hmm. know exactly what we still may not know exactly what we're dealing with. The mm-hmm. scientists disagree, the politicians disagree. But one of the things that your office did immediately, you took two weeks off when the, when the first closures were announced, Mm -hmm. and you rebuilt your office so Mm -hmm. that all the protections that people would expect were put in place. Mm -hmm. So you took out the waiting room. You have people call from the car. They come in individually. The doors are locked. Everybody wears masks. Uh, They they don't have face-to-face encounters except to come in and get the pellets or come in and have the conference with the physician. Mm -hmm. And then they leave, and then everything is re-sanitized. And so the Mm -hmm. precautions were expensive, and mm-hmm. and intense, and, and we you were doing that out of other people, <laughs> and, and you had to hire extra people mm-hmm. to do to do all that. But you did that out of an abundance of caution, saying we don't know what we're facing, but we know these things are believed to be helpful. Mm-hmm. So we will we will do these things, and then we'll wait and see how it unfolds. And as it unfolds, mm-hmm. there have been controversies about testing. And mm-hmm. the initial tests that were done were the ones where they used the 10-inch swab and put them all the way back in your brain stem. <laughs> oh, it really hurt. I had that done. I know. It's I know. very painful. But they count to 10 while they do it. That's a unique way of describing it. But <laughs> that is reputed to be the most accurate mm-hmm. test. That's the, the PCR test. That's the test that we're actually talking about. The today. long stem one? Yeah. Because the fast ones, the new faster mm-hmm. ones, they're not called that, but they're so. So the the long stem I, one that they rely on the most. These are the ones they've been using the whole time. That's why we have the research on it. Okay. And that's why the people that designed the tests, the test itself, is a good test, going up in your nose and yeah. getting the virus. However, the way it is done, it is interpreted, is the issue. So they take a swab and they put it in the back of your nasal cavity. And they pick up what's all the way back there, and that's what not at the beginning of your nostrils, right. but what's so they are attempting to measure whether or not it exists if you have the virus mm-hmm. in your system. Mm-hmm. So then they come back out, they read the results, and they say, "Well, yeah, you got the virus in your system." Right, but, but they you're don't saying just that's do not that. the significant piece. That's not the piece. Okay, so let why don't you explain? Okay, so so we've had very few of our patients become sick with the coronavirus, so. That made us keep an eye out for people who had it. So, so they, tested, they tested positive, but they were asymptomatic? They didn't have any symptoms or they if had minor symptoms? Not that many tested positive. And th- those who did had very minor symptoms. I mean, in general, there were a few people who got really sick. But in general, in our practice, we had very few people who got sick at all. They had positive tests, but they didn't have any symptoms. Right. And they stayed home and they quarantined and did all of that. But they weren't sick. Okay. So the question is, why would that occur? They have a positive test, and yet they have no symptoms, and why is that true? And so what, what the people who are experts in testing, experts in uh, designing tests 
and interpreting tests uh, got together and they said, you know, we're doing this test so that we are looking for just like one viral, tiny little uh, concentration of virus, which may or may not even be an infection. It may just be coming into your body. Your body fights it with its immune system. It never gets in your cells. You never get sick. You never communicate it. And then it's gone. And part of that has to do with how the test is done on the lab end. So here's how okay. you have to understand how vi PCR tests are done. Because so they take it and they put it in a vial and, and seal it, uh -huh. and they send it to a lab. Uh -huh. Then the lab uh, has Dilutes to, it. Dilutes it, but also has to have some kind of uh, solution mm -hmm. that it puts it in. Mm -hmm. Is it like a Petri dish to make it grow if it's there? No. Okay. No, it's, it's looking for the genetics of the virus, right. basically. But, but they dilute it, okay? So they, they, if, you have, if you get the test and they see the, the virus in the test initially, then you've got a really heavy load. It is, it is basically they're looking at, yeah, you've got this. You're going to spread it. But then they do dissolve it out to see how it to try to find just one tiny little or magnify it actually to get find the the virus so they're magnifying this test 40 times so they t so they can find like one tiny little virus they're not just finding a lot of active virus they're finding oh did we find just a little bit of virus it may have you may have just been exposed and your body kills it and then it's over and you got tested because you were exposed to somebody. So, so you take X amount. You have this little amount. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I said dilute. I meant magnify, and I apologize. So you take this little amount, and then you say, as if, as if you had forty times this amount. So now it's this big. Mm -hmm. Then how much of it would you have? And is it enough to say, well, hey, you got it? Well, they is they say all? it is. Yeah. So they magnify it 40 times and say, if, it's, if they find any virus at all, even magnified 40 times, you've got it. Well, that isn't, you, isn't in general when we're looking at any kind of virus. We only multiply it by or magnify it by 30 times, no more than 30 times to see if somebody really has the virus. They're magnifying it 40 times. So, so they're looking for a much smaller amount of virus. Yeah. And it does, whether you get the virus or not, does depend on how many people you are exposed to, how long you are exposed to them, how much virus, how uh, severe the virus, or how um, um, active the virus was when you got it. Those things matter. And well, so, so the assumption, too, that gets made, I think, by common citizens, people like me, at least initially when this was first happening, was if you get it, you're going to die. Right. And so it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who were getting it early on and dying from it mm -hmm. were the elderly mm -hmm. for whom, with whom, it was always comorbid. Right. They had you, other things wrong with them. You had other that. issues wrong mm -hmm. with you. And so it's like the last feather on the scale that causes the system to tip. Right. So. One of the reasons older, sicker people got severe disease or died from it. Whereas young, healthy people who had a good immune system could fight it before it even invaded their cells. So now the numbers have changed and more of the new cases that are being identified are in the 19 to 25 population, mm -hmm. college age kids, mm -hmm. recent mm -hmm. high school graduates who are trying their best to continue living the life that they have lived. But just think what college people do. They're having sex with people. They're kissing. They're hugging. They're living with somebody in a small in a close environment. I mean, most teenagers aren't going to give up that part of their lives. Most grownups aren't if they have that option available. Right, but but teenagers have lot. I mean, yeah. teenagers have lots of different partners, and they have a lot of different. They have a bigger group of social a social group than older people. Yeah. So so, so but even more. then, statistically, we don't have a good frame of reference, the, the death rates are going up in that population, but they're not as high as three percentage points of the total uh, mm -hmm. positive population. So most mm -hmm. people who get coronavirus don't die from it. Mm -hmm. Most people who get it, who get identified through this test, don't get it severely. Or don't even have a, they don't, with this test, yeah. done as it is right now, right. 
Most 90%, just a second, let me read what the New York Times said. August 29th, 2020. Uh, it caused me to be aware of this problem. So mm -hmm. the standard tests for coronavirus are diagnosing huge numbers of people who may carry insignificant amounts of the virus and are therefore not contagious. Okay? They aren't sick and they're not contagious. So the reason this, when they came up with this and they looked at the numbers. Where's my 90%? Um, there's a significant number that's that was 90% of the people that were tested really weren't going to be communicable and weren't sick, right? So, sounds, uh, sounds the PCR nice test is set up to overdiagnose the coronavirus by 90%. Right. So it's like finding a hair in a large room and saying that guy's going bald. It just it's just not necessarily going to lead to so, uh, morbidity. Again, additionally, this may have been a smart move when we didn't know what we were fighting, we didn't know what the virus was or how deadly it was. We mm -hmm. didn't know the percentages. We just knew suddenly it was spreading like wildfire and people, mm -hmm. older people especially, were dying. Mm -hmm. So they set it up to identify 90% of the people who might have it. Mm-hmm. And say these people then have to quarantine so that they can't spread it. Mm -hmm. And what this New York Times article and what your experience at your practice is showing you is that most of the people who have minimal amounts mm -hmm. are not contagious, don't get sick, aren't going to die, and mm -hmm. don't need to disrupt their lives so radically because of a positive diagnosis. And, and my concern with overdiagnosing anything. Okay, so I was at the gym today, and I heard uh, I heard a guy, big burly guy, fifty, who was talking about his doctor telling him that he had a positive test for something I don't know what it was, right. and how afraid he was, and how he didn't sleep, and how anxious he was, and he was ready to go on some medicine just so he could like live his life because of this fear, and then the doctor called up and said, oh, that was that test was wrong. So, I mean, that does happen. I'm oh, not yeah. criticizing the doctor. Yeah, I'm, cri no. I'm telling you that the fear of something, the anxiety that goes along with a positive test mm -hmm. is significant. It is, I, have, I mean, people in my practice won't go to their regular doctors because they don't want to be, want to be around sick people. My practice is well. So they, and they know we won't see them if they're not well. So they'll come to see us. But they won't go to a hospital even if they need it. People are dying at home because they're afraid to go to a hospital Yeah, because they don't want to get COVID. Well, they're going to die of something else at home because they're afraid. This is a, a real, a real worry. This is a real thing. Yeah. And anxiety, as you know, is, is detrimental to everything. Anxiety itself causes your cortisol to go up. It causes you to be, it causes you to not be able to think clearly. It causes you to have um, when you're really anxious about something, you have you have accidents, fall downstairs, get in a car accident because you're not thinking about mm -hmm. real life. You're you're ruminating over this worry and, and fear. Your reaction times are spiked up. Right. You, you you like take a glass of water. You're going to set down on the counter and you shove it into the side of the counter and break it or spill it. I mean, those kind of things happen all the time. People trip right. walking across the plane floor mm -hmm. if they have a lot of anxiety going on. Mm -hmm. But systemically, there were anxieties too. Uh, we were worried that the hospitals were going to be flooded. Mm -hmm. So nationwide, major hospitals said, well, we're going to stop doing elective procedures. Mm -hmm. We're going to clear out all the space. We're going to be ready for the influx of, of victims. We don't have enough ventilators. Oh, my God, everybody's going to die. Then they Which discovered, didn't okay, we, we didn't have that big a surge. We don't need that many ventilators. People, we found that ventilators actually don't necessarily help people get mm -hmm. healthier if they have coronavirus. But, again, it comes down to the question of viral load. So then the discussion becomes more elaborate, more extensive as they try to say, where is the critical information piece that we need to identify? Is it the volume? Is it running in the test 40 times higher than what you put on the swab and, and figuring a mathematical calculation and saying, okay, you're, you're dangerous. You're going to infect people. You may die yourself. Or is it, say, the traditional load of multiplied out 30 times, which is what's done historically with most viral. For all other viruses that we, we yeah. test for. Uh, the question of masks. 
very controversial issue about masks. And the stuff that I've read in, along this particular topic is that the protection is for other people, not yourself. And it mm -hmm. has to do with the amount of expulsion. If you have the virus mm -hmm. and you're breathing or coughing mm -hmm. or yelling or singing, mm -hmm. I mean, even choirs and churches have been restricted mm -hmm. while churches they try to figure this stuff out trick. because they try to measure how far does a, a droplet of moisture go from a normal exhale, from a yelled word, from a cough. And they say, if you wear a mask, it prevents that from mm -hmm. coming to me and connecting with me. So I am protected more if you wear a mask, is the argument that's made because of that issue. I still because think I'm they're... protected when I wear a mask. If two people are wearing a I, mask, I think if we're both wearing the them, we're better off. Exactly. Neither one of us is spreading them. But that, that then becomes a political agenda, what's freedom and what's right. But the medical piece, they're still trying to find the answers for this in a more precise, replicable way. One of the differences between science and other forms of analysis is that the scientific experiment has to be replicable anywhere with the same contents and get the same result. And so if I take a swab in Georgia and I take one in Alaska and I put it to the test, we should get the same amount of response from the same amount of infection. I think the test is replicable. Well, yeah. If you take it at the so if you take the swab at the same time, which says it's good person, science. So that's then good science, but you refine it to find the critical point, which is right. what the argument that this newspaper article was making in the New York Times is they've overdefined it. It's too severe in reading the results and you get a lot of false positives because you get a lot of people with a minimal viral load who aren't ever going to be infectious, who aren't ever going to have symptoms but have been labeled as having a positive coronavirus So all the test. numbers we see yeah. are, are not expanded trustworthy. expanded yeah, by yeah. a lot. So, but, but we don't know how much. So our fear, well, they yeah. say 90%. We're overdiagnosing by 90%. Right. That These are, the people that are talking are researchers who develop these tests, mm -hmm. who develop tests for bacteria and viruses, who know the science of how they work. And they said by, by changing... The normal rate of magnification from 30 to 40 times, we are overdiagnosing 90% of the time. So if you, you know, go to 10% of the numbers of people who are, who are having positive tests, that looks a whole lot different well, than, than the 100%. And it's understandable when, when the initial thrust of the pandemic was an unknown quantity. We don't know what it is. We don't know how lethal it is. We don't know how to fight it. We don't know what to do with we it. Don't have, so we, we want to catch it the earliest possible place out there mm -hmm. we can catch it. Mm -hmm. So let's make the, the most extreme measure the measure that we use. Mm -hmm. And then we'll identify these people. We'll isolate these people. We'll track it that way. Now they've had enough experience with it that they're saying maybe that's a too extreme measure. Mm -hmm. Let You're suggesting drop it back down to the traditional viral load measure mm -hmm. of 30%. Mm -hmm. Magnify it by 30%. If it's still a positive at that point, then, yeah, you've got something you need to be concerned about. Take normal precautions. If it's not positive at that point, then it's not positive. Quarantine right. is not an innocuous thing. Quarantine is people, like, it, it's innocuous for most people who are retired because they don't have to go to work to get, make money School in general. kids. School kids and their parents and teachers. Right. right. And, so it, it basically is causing families to be in a financial crisis. It's yeah. causing companies to go out of business. It's caught, So quarantine is important, and quarantining the right people is vital to making this whole thing work without making our country go under. So having a quarantine is not, I mean, I've heard people say, well, let's just quarantine everybody. Well, how do you get your mail? How do you, you know, how do you go to the doctor? How, how do nurses take care of people with COVID? You can't quarantine everybody, and you've got to have somebody to take care of their kids. So usually women have a, a deal to figure out how to take care of their kids in the summer, but and there's a lot of women who are teachers who can take care of their own children in the summer. But, but what do you do the rest of the year? How can you go to work? I mean, we've had some staff yeah. members go, I don't know if I'm going to be able to work because they haven't told me if my kid gets to go to school or not, right. and I don't know who can, who can take care of them. Right. So, so the, the repercussions of overdiagnosing the virus is huge. And I'm not saying people should just go willy-nilly, oh, we're done, we're just going to, you know, go out and cough on people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we have to be good, accurate, 
physicians and think about the fact that overdiagnosing can be just as dangerous as underdiagnosing for people. And so the, it's like crying wolf. The reason for sharing this information with you this week is that we want you to know that these discussions are underway and that the critical piece of information is continue to take all the safety precautions that you can reasonably take, but try to live your life as normally as you can while being respectful of the risk, just like you would be for drinking too much and driving. Mm -hmm. You have to take reasonable precautions and be a responsible person and know that the, the people involved in the process are trying to get the right answer every single day and that that answer changes as the data changes. Data matters. We'd like them to change the test, the PCR test, not the test itself, but the PCR test from 40 times to 30, just like other viruses, so that we have a more accurate number. So that's really our mission here. And you don't understand the if you don't understand the argument, you won't know what they're talking about. So we think if you understand it, you'll be able to talk to whoever you talk to to make changes in this country. If you have, if you have senators, if you have. Um, people who you know that you can actually talk to, then this would be helpful for them to understand the problem too, because they don't usually talk about this. And this was buried on the sixth page of the New York Times, because they're generally, they're, they've had a bad experience in New York with COVID, and because they have people piled on top of everybody, so it's very hard to distance. And then early on, it made it, they had a lot of illness and they had a lot of emergencies. So and a lot of deaths and a temporary lot of morgues deaths. everywhere. If if you want to check the article yourself, it's the New York Times, August 29th, ninth, twenty twenty. You'll be able to find it. Thanks for listening. Thank to you. Us. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance Healthcast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.